All right, everybody, welcome to OT with DA. Uh, we are joined by one of our favorites, Elise Harbolt is with us. Those of you that are on Instagram, we've already been sort of chatting for the last 10 minutes, but on YouTube, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Elise, you're gonna be with us for tonight, tomorrow and Saturday, and we're gonna do four sessions, not just the chapters, but a supplemental session, which will tell you a little bit more about tomorrow when we've got the date, or excuse me, the time tacked down. But Elise, just, just before we get into today's chapter, yeah, uh, just catch us up. Give us the, what have you been up to over the last year or less? What okay. are you doing with your life? Well, we'll start with this morning. <laughs> um, I ate. Okay, let's start with this morning. Cosmic Crisp Apple. This is the name. A cosmic? I did not know that there was such a thing as a Cosmic Crisp Apple. And I thought to myself, you know how there's this whole discussion of what type of fruit did Adam and Eve eat? Okay, I yeah. think it was cosmic. You think crisp. it was a cosmic crisp apple? I've never even heard of a cosmic yeah, crisp apple. It, I didn't know that was a it's thing. It's a mix between two different kinds of. Was apples. it tasty? It was amazing. <laughs> it better be amazing with the uh, after. If you're gonna call something cosmic crisp. That's right. Okay, so other than eating a cosmic crisp <laughs> apple this morning, what else have you been so up to? So in the last year, okay, um, <clears throat> I have been working on school. I've been finishing my master's in religion. I've been working my research paper. Um, I've been doing a lot of pet sitting. I've been doing mental health coaching uh, remotely, as well as some live-in um, coaching okay. situations. Cool. And mental health coaching. Uh, that sounds I, like I got something. to go to Vietnam. Whoa. Tell me about that. That was fascinating. So one of my friends was going, uh, didn't want to go alone. So I got my ticket paid or else I definitely would not have gone. <laughs> um, but yeah, we did some sightseeing, but also um, got to see some of the war sites, which mm. was very sad, but very interesting, like the tunnels, because they did a lot yeah. of tunnel warfare the Vietnam War, as well as the uh, uh, war museum. War is so sad. Yeah, terrible. Um, yeah, but it was it was very interesting. Were you there for a couple weeks or a week? Uh, or? Only in like 11 days. Okay. Yeah. And so that was how long ago? That was a week and a half ago. Oh, so just recently? Yeah. How was the food? So I imagine good. the food being so delicious. Good. And it's very affordable. Yeah. But did you get any massages while you were there? So I, that's one of my deepest regrets. I don't really want to talk about it because they have such affordable massages. That's that why I, I was like, whenever people it. go to Indonesia or Thailand or yeah. Vietnam, like the massages are yeah. cheap. I'm wondering, is, is anyone listening from Southeast Asia? We sometimes get people that tune in from India. Ah. Yeah, that's a thing that happens. Very cool. Okay, so you have been doing a little bit of traveling. Oh, tell me about the pet sitting. Okay, so... Um, I'm not trying to advertise for them, but there's this great app. It's called Trusted House Sitters. And you it's like Airbnb, but you don't have to pay. You just watch their pet. So I've actually been doing some of, I, I mean, I'm nomadic right now. I don't have an apartment. So I've been going around and doing these sits. So um, for example, I found a $156 plane ticket from New York to London. Okay. Wow. And I'm going to be doing a six-week pet sit in London. Because I'm just working on school, so it doesn't really matter where I am. Okay. Um, you can be mobile. Yeah. And this has helped me keep my expenses down while I um, am in school. What are you going yeah. to be sitting, pet sitting, sitting in London? A, a cat. And... <laughs> I do love dogs a lot more than cats. No offense. I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, why? That just fell right out of your mouth. Now, that, now there's going to be a whole conversation on. I'm, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I Cats, God made them too. But um, <laughs> it, it is better to get a cat pet sit if you want to leave the house more because, you know, dogs are in general. Cats are kind of self-sufficient. Dogs are kind yeah. of needy. Yeah. So you're, you're pet sitting a cat. In London. So you'll be able to go do some stuff. Yeah. Have you been to London before? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you'll be able... Do you have friends there? No, not yet. Well, you will. I'll try. Including a cat named what? Oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So at least you have... When do you finish up your, your degree? You this said summer. Worked... Oh, so soon. Yeah. So just in a few months? Um, Not too long. Will that be your third degree? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
Jesus. Are you just collecting degrees? You like my friend Anil. Do you know Anil? Yeah. He just collects degrees. Collects them. Well, my problem was more that I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I did too many things. Which. Do you know what you want to do now? Yeah. Okay, well, what do you want to do now? Other than eat uh, cosmic, <laughs> cosmic crisp, crisp apples. apples, what do you want to do with your life? Um, I want to be a theologian. Come on now. And I want to do some counseling as well. I love that. So yeah. like the combination of... Or a sheologian. A sheologian. Well, it's not a heologian. It's a theologian. I know. You just think it's cute. It's just cute because there, there aren't that many of them. We love you. We love having you here. And it's going to be absolutely awesome. You'll be joining us for four sessions total and quite a few chapters because tomorrow I think is a double. That's right. And then Saturday is a double plus a supplemental session. Yeah. So when you come, we get our money's worth. That's right. Because we pay you the big bucks to come here. <laughs> sushi. You pay, you pay me in sushi. We had vegetarian sushi tonight made by Violetta and it was delicious. Yeah. That's my opinion. So good. Okay. All right. You ready to pray for us? And we're going to get into yes. chapter. Let's pray. You know, this is, you know, that Prophets and Kings is divided into sections. Right. And now we're beginning section five, which is in the lands of the heathen. Okay. And our first chapter is chapter 39 in the court of Babylon. Is that the one you prepared for? Whew, what a relief. <laughs> what a relief. It's it. Daniel chapter we're one. We're on the same page. Okay. So Literally. we're going to be in, yeah, we, because you have your types and symbols. That's right. I had a guest earlier, uh, Nathan was here for a few days and he was reading from the old one. Oh. It's so different when you've been accustomed to reading yeah. the types and symbols yeah. and the New King James update and some of the language update. When he would read, it was just like, I mean, it was still, all of it was there. But for me, having had so much exposure now to the types and symbols in the New King James, it was, at times, it was a little painful. Mm. So I'm glad to see you have the types and symbols. <laughs> okay, Elise, okay. why don't you pray for us and we'll get started. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the chance to be all together. I'm so Amen. grateful for this community. Um, thank you for the story of Daniel. Mm. It's inspiring. It's entertaining. Um, it's so rich with meaning and it never gets old. So mm. I pray that you would guide our study, that you would um, give us wisdom and help us to reflect on the most important insights and to learn more about mm -hmm. your character and your will for our lives. And we pray this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Um, Elise, can I put you right on the spot and have you read oh. the story of Daniel? Daniel chapter one. Sometimes we do that. Okay. You got your Bible there? Indeed. So we're just going to read it through. I and mean, it's only 21 verses. It'll just take a few minutes. Might and as it, well. it gives us like, can you read that? Yes. Can I see it's that? It's not any smaller than when you read the Instagram Oh, it's much, comments. much smaller. Okay. Well, let's see if I'm can. so happy you can read that. Okay. I have 2010 vision. <laughs> not trying to brag. Not or bragging or anything. Okay. So we're just going to read uh, the whole of Daniel chapter one. You've already read this, no doubt, probably, but we're just going to read it through just so we know where we're going and the sort of backdrop upon which chapter 39 of Prophets and Kings is based. Okay. Okay. Let's go. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of, how do we say this? Uh, Shinar? Shinar? Shinar. To the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food, or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. 
And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink, for why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So would you endanger my head with the king? Oh, so you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Okay, great job reading. Every time you read that story. You know, my mom taught me to read when I was young. <laughs> oh, yeah? yeah? Okay, good. Um, every time you read Daniel chapter 1, it's great. It's great. I mean, it's such a short, I mean, it's only 20 verses, and 21 verses, and every time I read it, I feel a little, it, it's enter, like in your prayer, you said it's entertaining. Yeah. It really is yeah. entertaining, isn't it? Because there's drama, and there's conflict, and then there's resolve, mm -hmm. and... Uh, triumph. I mean, it's really like a, a movie. It's very cinematic. Okay. Um, so let's go. What we're going to do here, Elise, is we're going to motor through. We'll spend probably the next 45 minutes to an hour just sort of going through the text, okay. through the chapter, and then we'll do our rubric at the end, and then we'll do our word just like we, you know the drill. You know the drill. Um, okay. So I made you read the whole chapter there. So if you don't mind, I'll just read the first paragraph. I don't mind. You don't mind? And then anything that sort of jumps out at you there, we'll, we'll just spend as much time as we want and okay. sort of move our way through the chapter. Okay. Among the children of Israel who were carried captive to Babylon at the beginning of the 70 years captivity were Christian patriots, men who were as true as steel to principle, who would not be corrupted by selfishness, but who would honor God at the loss of all things. In the land of their captivity, these men were to carry out God's purpose by giving the heathen nations the blessing, the blessings that come through a knowledge of Jehovah. They were to be his representatives. Never were they to compromise with idolaters, their faith and their name as worshipers of the living God they were to bear as a high honor. And this they did. In prosperity and adversity, they honored God and God honored them. Hmm. Okay, that's a great summary paragraph. Yep. Is there anything in there that you really loved? Yeah, what jumped out to me was a part about um, their faith they were bearing as a high honor, mm. you know, because they're, they were just conquered. And so right. the popular sentiment was that their God was the weaker God. Correct. But they were still so confident in who their God was mm. that they were holding their heads high, right. you know, in, in our... Sort of dignified in defeat. Yeah, and in our increasingly secular culture, sometimes Christians tend, you know, we can become embarrassed. Mm. Um, but there's nothing to be embarrassed about. We can hold our heads high, too. Beautiful. No, I like it. And that, In fact, she actually gets into that in the second paragraph. The idea of the defeat, you know, the superiority mm -hmm. of one God versus the other. One of the things that jumped out to me in that first paragraph, and it comes up over and over again in the chapter, is she uses this language, a lot of synonyms for loyalty, mm. right? And so even in that first paragraph, I mean, I think the phrase, the use of the word patriots there is so interesting, right? Christian patriots. But just this idea, a patriot is somebody who's devotedly loyal to right. their culture, to their country. Right. So you have patriots, honor, representatives, a high honor. 
and then honored and honored. So, so we're, we're off to a start here where one of the major themes that she's going to develop is this idea of allegiance, devotion, loyalty. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that. She's setting the stage here to let us know that, that even though, as the second paragraph says, their God had been quote unquote defeated, that they were not going to slouch. Yeah. They were going to come in with a defeated mentality. They believed that they were God's covenant people, worshipers of the one true God, mm -hmm. and they were going to conduct themselves in accordance with that belief. Yeah. Okay, how about you read the second paragraph then? Okay. The fact that these men, worshipers of Jehovah, were captives in Babylon and that the vessels of God's house had been placed in the temple of the Babylonish gods was boastfully cited by the victors as evidence that their religion and customs were superior to the religion and customs of the Hebrews. Mm -hmm. Yet through the very humiliations that Israel's departure from him had invited, God gave Babylon evidence of his supremacy, of the holiness of his requirements, and of the sure results of obedience. And this testimony he gave, as alone it could be given, through those who were loyal to him. Mm. Okay, so you have that idea there of that the victors, she uses the word victors mm -hmm. there, that they viewed their conquest of Judah as evidence that their gods were superior. And, and this would have been an act of particular sort of religious and national humiliation that the articles of furniture, holy furniture that mm -hmm. were associated with Yahweh were taken in to the house of their god or gods. So everything is really not looking up for the Jews, but again, Daniel, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael are not carrying themselves as if they're defeated because they believe that, as we've said before, mm -hmm. this is not primarily about Babylon and Judah. This is about God and Judah. And Babylon is merely an instrument, mm -hmm. right? That, that they see this as an extension of God's chastisement of Judah and also of Israel for generational rebellion. Mm -hmm. so, so they can sort of hold these two ideas in tension in their mind. Yes, we've been defeated by a pagan power, but it doesn't follow, as it was, you know, sort of in keeping with the, the thinking of that day, conventional wisdom, that our God is weaker. Mm -hmm. It's just that God is superintending this process whereby he's allowing this heathen nation to punish us, to be an instrument in his hand. But they see this as an evangelistic opportunity, mm -hmm. which is, of course, what Israel was always supposed to be. Right. And I mean, it's extra meaningful when you think about the level of trauma that they've just been through. Like okay. they were just taken away from everything they knew. So they're right. experiencing this massive culture shock. But mm. like they they just know that God's going to use them. They know who God is. They still know who they are. Correct. Great point. Yeah, they know who they are. They know who God is. Now, the city at this point, when Daniel and his companions were first taken, this first group of captives that were taken back, has not yet been destroyed. I mean, that's what it says mm, there. In the mm -hmm, third year of the reign mm -hmm. of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So, so we still have Jehoiakim, and then we have Jehoiachin, and then we have Zedekiah. So the actual destruction of the temple mm -hmm. and of the city has not yet happened. When that does eventually happen, you can imagine that's going to be hugely deflating yeah. for the captives that were in Babylon, mm -hmm. right? So the other thing that kind of jumped out to me here is that you look at that last sentence in that second paragraph. This testimony he gave as alone it could be given through those who were loyal to him. So here's that theme again. Loyalty, Loyalty devotion, allegiance, yeah. etc. Um, so then now I'll read the third paragraph. Among those who maintained their allegiance, yeah, there it is again, to God were Daniel and his three companions, illustrious examples of what men may become who unite and with... And women. Thank you, men mm -hmm. and women may become who unite with God, uh, the God of wisdom and power. From the comparative simplicity of their Jewish home, these youth of the royal line were taken to the most magnificent of cities into the court of the world's greatest monarch. Nebuchadnezzar instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace. Mm -hmm. I'll read the next bit too. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Seeing in these youth the promise of remarkable ability, Nebuchadnezzar determined that they should be trained to, to fill important positions in his kingdom. That they might be fully qualified for their life work, he arranged for them to learn the language of the Chaldeans and for three years to be granted the unusual educational advantages afforded princes of the realm. Okay, so basically this is in keeping with this sort of vassal idea where you would have 
other nations, a large empire has conquered smaller tribes, regions, and areas. And then they will set these leaders up and the, the ruling families very often and the, the elites, for lack of a better term, they would be set up as vassals of the large empire. And presumably Daniel could work, you know, Daniel, we don't know exactly what Nebuchadnezzar's specific intent was for Daniel, Ananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, but they're going to work in some capacity in governance. But very often young people in this situation would be then exported back to their homeland where these Babylonian ideas have been infused into them. They're familiar with the culture. They're familiar with how it works. They have a regard for the king. They've seen the opulence of the place. And so they kind of go back as sort of emissaries to keep the peace and to try and, you know, make it easier to govern from afar on the, in the case of the Babylonians in this situation. So this is obviously they're being um, sort of trained for mm -hmm. some position of significant responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything to add to that? Three years, right? So basically college. I mean, we don't know how old they are. What are they, 17, 18, 16? Mm. Probably in their late teens, not older, I would imagine, than their early 20s, very early 20s. So this is kind of like a university degree. It's like they're going college abroad here, and they're going to, you know, to a, you know, a second language and a second culture, and it's going to be the Babylonian culture, and the mm -hmm. Babylonian literature, and the Babylonian language. Anything else there? Man, I'm I'm just really fascinated by the end of this page. Okay, why don't you read? So this is the name change? Yeah. Okay, read that. Okay. The names of Daniel and his companions were changed to names representing Chaldean deities. Great significance was attached to the names given by Hebrew parents to their children. Often these stood for traits of character that the parent desired to see developed in the child. The prince in whose charge the captive youth were placed gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Okay. Okay. Talk to us. Well, I think she gets into it more on the next page, but it's okay. this idea that this was an intentional move. Correct. You know, we don't, it's almost like trying to change someone's identity. Mm. And I was looking up, let me see if I can find it again, what their names meant. Mm. Um, their Hebrew names. Yeah. Um, the meaning of their Hebrews name name centered on the one true God. Yep. Daniel, God is my judge. Hananiah, Yah has been gracious. Mishael, um, who is what God is. Azariah, Yah has helped. So in their very names, they mm. were remembering um, God. And then it was interesting. I think it's on the next page. She says they weren't going to forbid them from worshiping their God, right. but they were hope they were hoping that all these changes, the name changes, the changes in their education, their culture, would naturally lead them to kind of forget about right. their their God. Mm. From from a Babylonian perspective, they would probably assume, in this case mistakenly, that well, these young people are going to want to learn about our gods because clearly our God is superior. Right. Right, so they just are assuming it's like whichever god wins that battle is the greatest. Correct. In their so now, if we give them exposure to our god, our culture, our history, our language, and we kind of wind them and dine them for mm -hmm. three years, they're obviously going to voluntarily come over. We don't have to compel them. We don't have to coerce them. They're going to see the superiority of our faith. Mm. So, so we have to understand that what's going on here in this larger story is not just a test over eating. Right. That, that the the eating of the food from the king's table is a stand-in for a massive tectonic religious conflict. Yeah. Right? Who will we listen to? Who will we obey? Whose ways are superior? And even though it seems like a small thing, and we're going to get into that, things that seem small are not always small, that what's going on here is not just like, I don't like onions and no mushrooms, please. What's going on here is this is going to be an example of a test between these two conflicting religious systems, mm. cultures, and gods. That's what's taking place here. So it's massively consequential. Mm -hmm. The other thing I always thought to myself is, is Daniel kind of got the short end of the stick with the name, right? Because <laughs> everybody else's name at least is, you know, somewhat similar, right? Mm -hmm. So you have um, uh, Hananiah, well, uh, Hananiah it becomes Shadrach. Okay, maybe that's not so much, but Mishael becomes Meshach. That's similar. And Azariah becomes Abednego. But Daniel yeah. becomes Belteshazzar. <laughs> and these names, just like their Hebrew names, he also... Jealous? I wonder. But these names also are references to the various deities right. of Babylon. 
they're sort of saying, yeah, not Yahweh, yeah. but now the god Nego or all these other, yeah. you know, various gods. I, I didn't look them up, but they have religiously significant and consequential mm -hmm. names. So you're right. It's it's you wouldn't call it brainwashing, but it is certainly a not so subtle um, persuasion yeah. about the superiority of the Babylonian ways. Now, one of the things that uh, in that next paragraph, the king could not compel the Hebrew did not compel the Hebrew youth to renounce their faith in favor of idolatry, but he hoped to bring this about gradually by giving them names significant of idolatry, by bringing them daily into close association with idolatrous customs, and under the influence of the seductive rites of heathen worship, he hoped to induce them to renounce the religion of their nation and to unite with the worship of the Babylonians. And one of Ellen White's favorite words, as we've seen in this book, whenever she's describing idolatry, specific branches of idolatry and kinds of idolatry, she uses the word seductive. Mm -hmm. And at least in the case, and we've talked about the fertility cults that were taking place in Israel, that was like literally seductive. Mm -hmm. The idea that there were these, you know, sexual rights that were going on, and we quoted Richard Davidson to this effect. But sometimes seductive might just mean it was opulent, it was beautiful, it was ornate, mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. it was alluring. Right. So the idea here enticing. is that it's enticing. Mm -hmm. We're going to win these young men over. These are smart. They're young. They're impressionable. They're high, high capacity, high quality. We're going to expose them to the best of the best of the best of Babylonian culture, language, literature, food, mm -hmm. and they're gonna they're gonna shift. Mm -hmm. That's the thinking. And in fairness, it looks like most of them did. Right. Because the only ones we know that didn't shift, at least in this case, and we'll get this again in Daniel chapter three, mm -hmm. is Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. Just those three. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the test, right? Into the very test. Um, I'm probably going to have you read, if you don't mind, okay. just starting it at the very outset. Just read that paragraph okay. right there. At the very outset. Top of, of page 460. At the very outset of their career, there came to them a decisive test of character. It was provided that they should eat of the food and drink of the wine that came from the king's table. In this, the king thought to give them an expression of his favor and of his solicitude for their welfare. But a portion having been offered to idols, the food from the king's table was consecrated to idolatry, and one partaking of it would be regarded as offering homage to the gods of Babylon. In such homage, loyalty to Jehovah forbade Daniel and his companions to join. Even a mere pretense of eating the food or drinking the wine would be a denial of their faith. To do this would be to array themselves with heathenism and to dishonor the principles of the law of God. Okay, so this is what we're talking about when we see that the Food is a stand-in for a larger religious cultural conflict. Yeah. And and that we should, you know, let's be fair here. The text never expressly says, oh, this food was offered to idols and this food was... Right. It just says that Daniel refused to defile himself. So there must have been something that Daniel and his companions regarded as sufficiently defiling that they just couldn't do it. Right. And the sacrifice to idols makes the most sense. Right. And it could have been multiple things because they were used also to following specific dietary guidelines. Yeah, it could have been so a, could like have been foods a... that they regarded as unclean. Yeah, very good. Um, next paragraph says, Nor dared they risk the enervating effect of luxury and dissipation on the physical, mental, and spiritual development. They were acquainted with the history of Nadab and Abihu, that's the sons of Eli, the record of whose intemperance and its results had been preserved in the parchments of the Pentateuch. And they knew that their own physical and mental power would be injuriously affected by the use of wine. So just recently, I told a story on here. I don't know how much depth I went into, but I have a, a bunch of people that I rock climb with, not all of whom are, well, basically none of whom are Seventh-day Adventists and just a few of whom are Christians. And one of my uh, climbing friends who I love dearly, he was telling me that he just did dry January or is doing dry oh, January yeah. and then yeah. he decided to do dry February. Yeah. And then one of my other friends sort of involved in this conversation, he said, you know, David, how often do you drink alcohol? And I said, never. I, I drank alcohol when I was like a teenager and never did again. Mm -hmm. And they were both just like flabbergasted at this. Just like, right. whoa, really? That's just wild. And the remarkable thing about it was, and you know, it wasn't like a judgmental thing. It was just, I don't have time for that. It's not something I ever got into. It was never really a part of my culture. Yeah. And drinking wasn't like a big thing in my home. And the one time I did drink, it was like a terrible experience. And mm. I'm, it's just, I've never had time for it. 
-hmm. It's just not a part of my life. And at the same time, I, I think that what's on offer here is not just the, you know, she describes the that wine, you know, is a mocker and strong drink is raging, but just the idea that the whole thing, the luxury, the food, possibly unclean, offered to idols, the rich foods, the wine. Right. They couldn't say, well, we'll take this, but not this. Mm. We'll take some of this, but not this. They just said, no, we, we're not doing this. Okay. We're not doing this. And uh, you, you're not a drinker. No. Never. Never. Just wasn't your thing. No. I mean, I grew up that way. Yeah. But I've always been really grateful. Um, Same. Right? And And... I think especially working and having worked in the mental health field and mm. seeing the effect of alcohol on, on mental health and relationships in that way made me even more grateful. Um, but I am careful about, like you were saying, careful about how I talk about it. Correct. So because sometimes, you know, I get the same response like, whoa, whoa. And um, I like how you responded. You're not making a huge deal out of it. Mm -hmm. You're not saying that you're better than, than Right, them. exactly. Just, because anytime you say, and it's true even with like the vegetarian thing, if you sort of, you know, you've seen that little, I mean, there's all these really funny memes where it's like, um, you know, they're at a funeral or they're at a wedding and the minister will say, does anybody have anything they'd like to say? And somebody will say, I'm vegan, you know, just like all these little funny things. There's such yeah. a sort of cultural meme around yeah. people coming off as superior or signaling, you know, virtue signaling about something. So right. We don't want to be perceived that way. I mean, I just don't drink alcohol. It's right. not something I do. I don't think it's best. I don't think it's ideal. But if you drink alcohol and you're taking dry January, I'm happy that you're taking dry yeah. January. I think that's great. I have to tell you guys about this. I found this. Okay, um, let's hear it. Oh, man, dude. I think it's called the reframe. There's this really good Instagram. You're on airplane mode. Oh, that's right. Keep talking. You can take it off. Keep talking. There's a really good um, Instagram account that they, they post all about the effects of alcohol. And it's not from a religious perspective or anything. They're yeah. just trying to educate. They post yeah. really good stuff. And sometimes it's funny. So sometimes I post. Um, Some of the things they do. They post people's stories. Like a lot of times people just feel a lot better if they either eliminate it completely mm. or cut back. And um, yeah, it's good stuff. Well, one of my friends was saying that he he's a really strong rock climber and he and I climb together a lot. And he was saying that he always sends his hardest roots in like, January, February, March, because he's either in dry January, which he's now extended yeah. to dry February, or he's coming out of that uh -huh. because he loses eight to 10 pounds. He gets better sleep. And alcohol is a disaster for testosterone. For men, it's terrible. Right. right. By the way, if you want a, a great uh, resource, if you're not already familiar with him, is Andrew Huberman, mm -hmm. the Huberman Lab podcast. He has a lot to say. He's a neuroscientist. A lot to say about the dangers of alcohol. Highly recommend. What do you got? Okay, yeah, it's called the Reframe app. They've got all kinds of stories, testimonies. And, oh, this is and they great. also have a, a system for helping people quit if they want to. Okay. Um, yeah. That's great. It's good. The Reframe app. And, you know, it, it used to be there were these studies saying, oh, you need a little bit of bread wine for your heart health or whatever. But there was a big meta analysis that came out, I think, last year, basically showing, you know, there really aren't health benefits to drinking right. alcohol. The the nutritional benefits can be found in other things. So there's been quite a bit of corruption in the research, which has led some people to think that they actually needed to drink alcohol mm. for the health but alcohol increases the risk of cancer and you know many other diseases. Many other yeah. Yeah, strongly recommend checking out Andrew Huberman. So much of what he says is brilliant. In fact, do you know do you know Dr. Schwelt? Roger oh, yeah, yeah. Medcram. So he is getting ready to be on Andrew Huberman's podcast. Oh, no way. Yeah, way. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I was way. just visiting with him. Way. I was just visiting with him when we were in Southern California and uh, talking to Roger and his, his wonderful wife, Betty. He's got two cool kids, too. Mm. And he was telling me, yeah, he's getting ready to be on the Huberman podcast. And Ty Gibson is like a Huberman disciple. Like, mm. devote. he just like listens to everything that Andrew Huberman. If Andrew Huberman says to do it, Ty basically does it. And when Ty found out that Roger was going to be on the Huberman podcast, he was like, what? He just couldn't believe it. He was just yeah. blown yeah. away because Huberman's on this, like, I don't know if you knew this or not, this like total spiritual journey right now. Mm, he's wow. like praying to God. He's reading through the Old Testament. He's like having a oh, real need spirit. To pray for him. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially, you know, Roger's going on there and Roger's a, he's a strong man of God. Mm. So Anyway, I just like the idea here that we we live in a culture where the drinking of alcohol is normalized mm -hmm. and we need to be, this is my opinion, we can be very firm in our convictions, which I'm very firm in my mm -hmm. convictions, 
But we can also be understanding that lots of people don't share our convictions mm -hmm. and the way that we communicate to them should not come off as condescending or judgmental. Yeah. It's just like, and if people make steps, like my sister, if she was here, Elizabeth, she's wonderful. She is now, I think, six years sober. She had a real awesome. struggle with mm -hmm. alcohol. And it was just something that was not good for her. It was not good for her life. And now she's sober and she's like a sponsor for others. She's very involved in mm. AA. And there are a lot of people for whom a high, 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 yeah. too high of a percentage for whom alcohol is catastrophic. Right. It's not just like a recreational, you know, and there's a movement right now. There's this whole like movement of like the reframe app you were describing and like the mocktails mm -hmm. and these like right. alcohol less bars and things yeah. where people want to still have the, you know, the connection and the social networking or whatever it might be, but just without the alcohol. Because alcohol is bad news. Mm -hmm. It's just not good. Mm -hmm. Okay, bottom of that paragraph, uh, bottom of that page, why don't you read the paragraph, Daniel and his associates. Daniel and his associates had been trained by their parents to habits of strict temperance. They had been taught that God would hold them accountable for their capabilities and that they must never dwarf or enfeeble their powers. This education was to Daniel and his companions the means of their preservation amidst the demoralizing influences of the court of Babylon. Mm. Strong were the temptations surrounding them in that corrupt and luxurious court but they remained uncontaminated. No power, no influence could sway them from the principles they had learned in early life by a study of the word and works of God. I love it. Can I say one more thing? Of course, before we talk? please. Um, since a lot of the people that, that view um, your reading challenges are Seventh-day Adventists, not everyone, yeah. obviously we welcome everyone, uh, are Seventh-day Adventists. Um, I've become more aware recently of how People who are Adventists who are struggling with alcohol mm. feel a lot of shame and stigma because, right. because it's kind of culturally it's just not accepted. Right. And I think it's really important that, you know, even though we um we like promoting temperance, um, that we create, you know, a safe environment for people to speak up and get help. Sure. Because I think a lot more people are struggling with alcohol than we realize. Than we imagine. Mm -hmm. One of my closest friends in the world who has unfortunately passed away. Uh, at the age of 53, it's a terrible, sad story. He was he was like a brother to me. But he was a closet alcoholic as a teacher. Mm. In, and he, he this is his own testimony. He's told this testimony, mm -hmm. so it's public knowledge. But as a teacher in Adventist schools for years, he was a closet alcoholic. His, his own wife didn't know that he was a closet alcoholic. Wow. And yet he was a total alcoholic. And he was just racked with guilt, racked with shame, wow. and working in a Christian school, attending church, trying to be a you know a Christian husband, mm -hmm. and the whole time wrestling with an addiction that he could not turn really easily to any place within his right within his religious community I mean, because they would be so like, what? Yeah, what? How can that be? You're a exactly. Right. So we do need to be aware that just because as a sort of larger culture we say, no, nah, we don't think alcohol is best. It doesn't automatically mean that people aren't struggling with it. Mm -hmm. Just like we're in a culture where we say, hey, look, uh, internet pornography or pornography writ large, adultery, not best, drugs, not best, gambling, not best. Do we imagine that every single person that is in our church or attending or coming you know, inside of our community that they don't wrestle with the various addictions mm. that everybody else wrestles with? No. So we need to create communities and, and friendship networks of accountability and of trust where people can get the help they need. Mm -hmm. And if they're not going to get the help they need with Jesus and with church and with the community of faith, well, then where are they going to get it? That's right. Okay, thank you so much for saying that. Okay, now, one of my favorite paragraphs is that, okay, you have something more you want to say there. No, I'm okay, waiting for you. The top of the next page, 461, this okay. is one of my favorite paragraphs because this is where basically Ellen White sets up that there could have been some really plausible excuse making yeah, for yeah. eating of the food, right? Like you could have said, oh, well, and she actually goes into that. So I'm going to read that there. Okay. Top of page 461. Had Daniel so desired, he might have found in his surroundings a plausible excuse for departing from strictly temperate habits. He might have argued uh, that dependent as he was on the king's favor and subject to his power, uh, there was no other course for him to pursue than to eat of the king's food and drink of his wine. For should he adhere to the divine teaching, he would, oh, maybe offend the king and probably lose his position and his life. Should he disregard the commandment of the Lord, he would retain the favor of the king and secure for himself intellectual 
advantages and flattering worldly prospects. Mm -hmm. All of that is totally plausible and even reasonable. Like in other words, you, you could have made a believable, plausible case and clearly many of the other Hebrew captives must have been doing something like this. Yeah. Right, like sort of contextualizing, well, we're here, when in Rome, do it, obviously Rome isn't yet on the scene, but this idea that we're gonna contextualize, we're gonna go along to get along. Right. I like that she just addresses that head on, that it would not have been particularly difficult, you wouldn't have required too much mental gymnastics right. just to talk yourself into going along with the program. Right, it's like uh, the end justifies the means. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, but then the next paragraph begins, why don't you read it? But Daniel did not hesitate. Mm -hmm. The approval of God was dearer to him than the favor of the most powerful earthly potentate, dearer than life itself. He determined to stand firm in his integrity, let the result be what it might. Mm, come on now. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. You know what I love about this is it's so relational. Yes. You know? Yes. It's like, oh, I, I want God to approve of what I'm doing. I, I want God's favor on my decisions. It's not like, oh, I oh. have to do this. I have to be really self-controlled. Mm. It was relational. Very relational. Yeah, I agree. Totally. And in this resolve, he was supported by his three companions. Now, you weren't with us yesterday. <laughs> Just listen to this, Elise. You're mm. going to kick out of this. It's sad, but it's, it's pretty remarkable. So in yesterday's chapter... We talked about Zedekiah. Let me just see if I can find this. Um, maybe it was the chapter before. It was carried captive into Babylon. Okay, so listen to this. Um, <laughs> so she's describing how Zedekiah was secretly going to Jeremiah mm -hmm. and sort of asking, hey, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Are the Babylonians going to come? And he was afraid to let anybody know that he was going secretly to Jeremiah because his counselors and others would hold him in contempt because Jeremiah was giving bad news and the false prophets were giving good news. And this is Ellen White's evaluation of Zedekiah. And I want you to contrast what we just read about Daniel and his companions with this description, this very unflattering description mm -hmm. of Zedekiah. It says, he sacrificed to this, is page 436 of the types and symbols. He sacrificed the noble freedom of his manhood and became a cringing slave to public opinion. Ooh. Ooh, isn't that just the most unflattering description of anyone ever? A cringing <laughs> slave to public opinion. Now contrast that with, but Daniel did not hesitate. The approval of God was dearer to him than the favor of the most powerful earthly mm -hmm. potentate, mm -hmm. dearer than life itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can just see the contrast here between mm -hmm. Daniel and his resolve and his allegiance and his loyalty and his love mm -hmm. for Yahweh and the king Zedekiah, who's just like a cringing slave to the winds of public opinion fascinating the contrast and i love the word purposed here right the the i think i'm reading from the new international version here and it says mm -hmm. something a little different i think it says it, daniel resolved in okay. his heart but i love the word purposed daniel purposed in his heart that mm -hmm. he would not defile himself mm -hmm. i prefer that version you got anything else there um oh i just thought um it highlights the power of Christian friends, the power of believing friends. Yes. Because he wasn't alone. Even though they were certainly a minority, um, they were encouraging one another. And I think sometimes we underestimate how mm. how much we can influence the people around us Correct. just by the choices that we're making and, and by our encouragement. Oh, that's great. I love that. Yeah, we often talk about Daniel and his companions, but we're going to see in Daniel chapter 2 and in Daniel chapter 3, this was not a one-off. These They were obviously a very tight-knit community of people that had probably collectively in their personal prayers and conversations said, you know what? We're here. We're going to bring honor to our God. We're going to bring honor to our culture. We're going to bring honor to our city. We're going to bring honor to our parents. We're going to do the right thing. Yeah. And probably trying to persuade others to come along with them, but yeah. there's no record that that others did. Right. Doesn't mean they didn't, but the record that we have is of Daniel and his companions. I also like how she pointed out right after that, they weren't trying to be weird. Oh, read that. You've got, that's okay. one of the best lines in the whole thing. Do you want to read it? Uh, 461 in the types and symbols, 483. Sure. The one that begins in reaching this decision. Yeah. Yeah. This is so great. In reaching this decision, the Hebrew youth did not act presumptuously, but in firm reliance upon God. They did not choose to be singular, but they would be so rather than dishonor God should they compromise with wrong in this instance by yielding to the pleasure of, or pressure of circumstances 
Their departure from principle would weaken their sense of right and their abhorrence of wrong. Their first wrong step would lead to others. Until their connection with heaven severed, they would be swept away by temptation. Mm. Yeah, what do you love there? Yeah, just they weren't they weren't saying, oh, we want to be different. Exactly. We want to be weird. But they were saying we want to follow God. And if that makes us look weird, then we're okay with that. I also think it's interesting um, saying departing from right in a small way yes. then weakens your resolve. This reminds me of, I can't remember if I've shared this yeah. um, here before or not, but there was a study on lying and they did brain imaging and they had people um, say something that they knew wasn't true. So mm. they're watching what their brain does while they say a statement that's not true. It's not true. And at first, um, the amygdala was lighting up, firing uh, a lot, mm. which shows that there was an emotional response attached to lying. Their brains were saying, no, something's wrong. And Don't there was, say that. There was cognitive dissonance and some sort of response. But then as they kept repeating the lie, yes. that firing got less and less and less until it wasn't. And so this is you know, why dishonesty is so scary because you can desensitize your own self from a lie and even start to believe the lie, right. which is like in the Bible, it, it talks about, or Jesus says, if you're dishonest in little, you'll be dishonest in much. Mm. And I think they take this principle really seriously in like our habits are so important. Yes. It's not just about the little habit. It's about where that will take me. Yeah. Have you read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits? Uh, no, but I'm familiar with the, yeah, the concept. Yeah. yeah my, my youngest son is reading it right now. And it's basically just about the idea atomic that, that we make tiny little changes that cumulatively make big changes. Right. And this is not only true, like in terms of personal, you know, productivity and development, but just morally. One of the things, going back to the comparison between Daniel and Zedekiah, you might remember that one of the phrases that was used to describe Zedekiah was that he lacked moral stamina, mm -hmm. which is a fascinating way to yeah. say it. You know, like you think about muscles, we talked about this yesterday, or cardiovascular health. I mean, you've run marathons. Yeah. I don't anymore. You don't but anymore, it's, but it's you happened. have. But just the idea that you have to develop the capacity to do that. Yeah. And you do that on lots of little training days. Yeah. It's like cumulatively you're de you're developing the capacity to do something that you would not just be able to do off the couch. You know, yeah. most of us couldn't just do off the couch. So similarly here, when you make a decision in small things, then those small things aggregate and accumulate. And over time, yeah. you just are becoming a different person, you're becoming a certain kind of person. So for example, with with the the food here, when the food is presented to them, they, even at a young age, they have so much moral stamina and moral momentum mm -hmm. that they're just like, no, that's not something we do. Yeah, They're not deciding in that moment, uh, 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 uh. when the food is presented, they say, we can't do this. Right. We cannot bring dishonor to our God. And the lesson for us here is, is that if we're placed in a situation where people think we're weird, she uses the word singular, but yeah. the synonym here is weird. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be weird for weird sake. I mean, we live in a world right now that is like everybody's trying so hard to be different. Right. You know, set themselves apart in some weird way, whether it's piercings or tattoos or hair color or whatever, you know, feats of strength, whatever. We, people are just, hey, look at me, look at me, look at me. That's, you know, one of the byproducts of the social media phenomenon. But we should not be reluctant to be perceived as weird if we're just doing the thing that we know God wants us to do. Mm -hmm. And and if we land in a weird place, fine. Then people think we're a little weird. Like I don't swear. Mm -hmm. Like when I'm around my climbing friends, I'm just not a swearer. Mm -hmm. And they detect that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's just detected. It's like, oh, you don't swear. Oh, you don't drink. And oh, you don't want to go climbing on Saturday. Because they'll say, oh, we're going to be climbing this Saturday. The weather's going to be really good or whatever it might be. Like, I'm not trying to be a weird person. That's just who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, do they perceive it as weird? Yeah. Do they sometimes express interest and say, hey, well, why do you or why don't you or why? Well, great. But there's a relational connection there where I'm hoping that it will become, you know, evangelistic opportunities. But we don't just do idiosyncratic things so that people will think that we're weird. And that's what's taking place here. They're acting out of principle, not out of some desire to be a little different or a yeah. little better than others. Mm -hmm. Okay. You got anything else? No, I'm just excited to talk about this test. Okay, let's talk about the yeah. test. Let's skip right to the, where do you want to go? Page 462. Okay. So, um, 
One thing I've heard that I thought was interesting is in Daniel 1, as Daniel negotiates to be able to do this experiment, um, you can find the basic principles of negotiation, like business negotiation. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I love it. She even <laughs> says that Daniel knew that his case was won. Yeah. yeah it's just like he's, oh, okay. Yeah, go, like, go I love that, that too. Like, you know, it, from everyone else's perspective, it's like, oh, this is some big deal. You know, are we going to die? Like, <laughs> and Daniel's like, oh, they said yes. Like, we like, got this. Game, we got, got, got this. Right? It's right? game over. We've won. Yeah. But I also have heard this um, referred to as the first controlled health trial in history. Yeah, right? I love because it. you I have the it. control group of the people that are eating the king's food. Yeah. And you have Daniel and his friends. And um, yeah, I just love how confident Daniel was in um, what God's principles would do, would do. And it's fascinating that. Um, in just 10 days, because some of the like lifestyle centers have um, put this to the test as well and said, yeah, how much oh, can someone's days. health oh, shift in 10 days? Love it. Um, and so, you know, taking people with type 2 diabetes or hypertension or and just placing them on a simple plant-based diet for 10 days. It's amazing how much can happen. An in incredible shift. Days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel really does come off if you read between the lines and especially if you read prophets and kings he comes off as quite like winning when he's speaking to right was it ashpenaz there and he said hey how about this how about that what do you you can just see and he in, it inspires and elicits confidence that the even the guys like uh oh, you know i don't think the king is going to like this but he somehow daniel in his negotiation in his winsome personality yeah. he persuades him yeah that which tells us that daniel could not have been robotic and impersonal and he must have been affable, yeah. approachable. Hey, 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 listen, I know this is going to put you in a difficult spot, but how about this? Why, why don't we try this? Right. You know, can't you just okay. see him? He's winning. He's winsome. He's interesting. He's not a robot. I will not eat. No. When if he <laughs> is keep, all keep of... Going. Did funny. you like that? <laughs> <laughs> if, he's, if he's all of these things, if he's an A-plus student, he can not only be bookish smart and mm. morally, you know, convicted and committed... But he is relationally intelligent. Mm -hmm. He has a high EQ. Yeah. So he knows that this guy that he's dealing with here, that his responsibility is, hey, I got to take care of you guys. So Daniel appeals to that aspect. He said, hey, look at this. Mm -hmm. How about this? A 10-day trial. How much can go wrong in 10 days? Right. We'll do a 10-day trial. It's so winning. It's so You can read between the lines and see that Daniel was the kind of person for which you would want to give him the benefit of the doubt and give him a... Okay, we'll give you a little concession here. Yeah. Let's try it out. Yeah. I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I really like that. Um, you got anything else there? She uses the word simple a couple times, like the simplicity of their home, simple food. Okay. Simple food. So it does contrast the simplicity with the, you know, sort of ostentatious, mm -hmm. seductive influence of the Babylonian court. Mm -hmm. Not just the food, but presumably, you know, relationships, whatever might have been available. That, that they were just like, no, we're going to just stick to the basics here. We're going to do it simple. Yeah. Give us some water. Give us some food. You know, presumably we want to get some good night's rest. We want to take good care of our health. We're going to do this. Then check back in on us in 10 days. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to read the, or why don't you read the paragraph there for three years the Hebrew youth studied? Okay. For three years, the Hebrew youth studied to acquire the language and literature of the Chaldeans. During this time, they held fast their allegiance to God. Allegiance, there it is again, mm -hmm. right? And depended constantly upon his power. With their habits of self-denial, they united earnestness of purpose, diligence, and steadfastness. It was not pride or ambition that had brought them into the king's court, into companionship with those who neither knew nor feared God, they were captives in a strange land placed there by infinite wisdom. Mm. Separated from home influence and sacred associations, they sought to acquit themselves creditably for the honor of their downtrodden people and for the glory of him whose servants they were. Yeah, this, that's such a great paragraph. Mm. You know, they're not there out of any sense of self-importance. Pick me, pick me. They're captives in a strange land, and yet they see every situation and circumstance in which they find themselves. I mean, this is tremendously mature thinking for such young people. They're like, no, we're here to bring honor to our God and glory to his mm -hmm. name. They understood, going all the way back to the, the sort of Abrahamic promise, that God's plan was always the blessing and benefit of the surrounding nations. Mm -hmm. And you might remember that Jeremiah had said over and over again, when you go to Babylon, pray for the peace of the city, plant your trees, plant your gardens, build your houses, 
work for the good of Babylon because you're going to be there for 70 mm -hmm. years, you know, a few generations. So settle in and be a blessing. So I love this idea here that even in situations where we are working under less than optimal, less than ideal, mm -hmm. less than godly situations, we can still work within our sphere for the benefit of the people above us. Yeah. I, 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 because I think there would be some people that would say, oh, how could you do that? He's pagan. How can you help him? How can you? Assist? No, no. We're here to bring honor and glory to the name of our God. And we're not out of here, out here, out of any sense of self-importance. We just want to do our best mm. for the glory of God's name, which I love. I think that's the whole point here. In fact, she actually says in the next paragraph, the Lord regarded with approval the firmness and self-denial of the Hebrew youth and their purity of motive and his blessing attended them. And that's the whole point. The, the thing here is, okay, it's not not about a vegetarian diet. Okay, I'm willing to hear that. I'm willing to hear that we should eat simply and we should live simply and we should avoid, you know, alcohol. I'm cool with all that. But what this is really about is exactly what she says here, placing yourself in a position where God can bless you. Yeah. Because the difference is the blessing of God. God's blessing is on their behavior, on their conviction, on their purpose, on their decisions. Mm -hmm. And their decisions were, of course, in keeping with what we now know about human health you know, alcohol and other things, but it wasn't just the vegetarian diet. It was God's blessing right. on them. That's the thing. I love it. In that paragraph, she said, she um, cites 1 Samuel 2.30, those who honor me, I will honor. And yes. you really see that in this chapter. And, you know, so much so that by the end of the experiment, um, they were found 10 times better than right. all. And that's all because they placed themselves in the stream of God's blessing. Yeah that God's blessing is clearly upon them and the favor that that they were given, not only in the eyes of Ashpenaz in the 10-day yeah. trial, but in the larger three-year course of study, you know, they apply themselves. And this is what she gets into here. She gets into, it wasn't just the blessing of God and then they were, you know, you know, limply cooperating. No, no, they were active in practicing good habits of study and applying themselves right. so that they could place themselves in an optimal position for God to bless yeah. them. And imagine they also felt a lot better than the, you know, they probably felt 10 times better. We yeah. sometimes just think about, you know, the state of our health, but making healthy choices or recovering from addiction or whatever it is makes you feel a lot better. Yeah, I, I don't want to come off as uh, sounding proud here or anything, but I will say that one of the things that Sleeping well and eating well and getting, mm -hmm. a, getting, getting good exercise does for you, just living a healthy lifestyle, is it keeps you away from a lot of the things that people kind of need to function. Yeah. And when I sometimes hear my friends or even maybe sometimes family members or whatever talk about, you know, how many cups of coffee they have to have in the morning just to get, you know, to functioning. And there's all this memes, you know, about mm -hmm. how much coffee ha people have to have to function. And listen, I love the smell of coffee, actually. And I actually occasionally will have a decaf coffee because I think it just tastes good. But there is certainly a sense in which people are running so ragged. Mm -hmm. They're not taking good care of themselves. They're not getting good exercise. The relationships aren't healthy. They're not physically strong. So they need artificially to prop themselves up. And it's amazing how if you don't have to do that, you just like I get up in the morning. I'm like, OK, let's go. Let's do yeah. stuff. You know, let's 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 do things, and you eat well, and you don't have. Okay, do I sometimes get sick? Yes, of course. Do I sometimes get feel a little run down? Yes, of course. But when we live a healthy lifestyle in terms of our body, our spirit is better, our emotion is better, our mind is better. Mm -hmm. We're just designed for not being sick and not needing these sort of you know artificial things to prop us up. So I yeah. love that. I just it it makes me feel really happy that. Like I go to the doctor and they say, you know, do you take any drugs? No. Yeah. Do you do you, do you, do you smoke? No. Mm. Yeah, occasionally you'll get pulled over by a police and say, have you had anything to drink? Not for 40 years. Right. You know, it's just like, no, I don't, I don't have Yeah. That. I think we need to be intentional about how we think about health choices because it's so pervasive in our culture that self-indulgence is a good thing. Yeah. You know, correct. like, oh, just allow yourself to make the unhealthy choice. Allow yourself to stay up late or... You know, eat you deserve whatever. it. You deserve, right? 
You deserve to make yourself feel miserable. You deserve miserable, to make yourself right? feel crap. Um, but we can reframe it instead of I have to do this. It's like I get to do this. Correct. I'm going to splurge and go to bed early instead <laughs> of scrolling through Instagram. Like Right, exactly. Yeah. One of the things I've learned about myself is that I, if I eat, this is like formulaic in my life. If I get a poor night's rest or two in a row mm -hmm. and I eat refined sugar, I will get sick. Oh, it's wow. just, it's just out automatic. If I eat a donut or something, or I eat some refined sugar, I won't necessarily get sick. Usually not. But if that's coupled with, like I've learned if I travel and I'm just mm -hmm. not on my game and before you know it, I eat something that's, and almost always when I get sick, I can look back and say, well, of course I got sick because I did this and this and this. And over years, I've been able to identify poor sleep coupled with refined sugar is a recipe mm. for disaster for me. Mm -hmm. It just, it's like, I know I can't do those things. So the easier thing to do is to largely avoid, for me, refined sugar, because do I love the taste of donuts? Yes. Do I love a cinnamon roll? I saw this meme the other day that mm -hmm. said, I, I want buns of steel and buns of cinnamon. <laughs> but just the point is, when we make a, what we perceive to be a small sacrifice, it actually benefits us. And for me, health and happiness and just the ability to go do the things I want to do actually outweighs, you know, yeah. eating a piece of cheesecake. Right. And I think, too, we underestimate um, how much our our cravings and tastes can change. Correct. Like, you know, and I'm saying this coming from having had a really serious food addiction. I had bulimia. I, you know, I had out of control binge eating. And, you know, it seemed, I know I've talked about this before, but it's relevant to this chapter. Like it sometimes seems when you're caught up in an addiction, whether it's that or pornography addiction or whatever, like, oh, my um, my urges, my impulses are, are always going to feel this strong. But God made, get, uh, created our bodies with this amazing capacity to heal mm. um, where I don't have those same out of control cravings really at all. Um, so we shouldn't underestimate how like taste buds can change and habits can change. And sometimes temptations that seem really, really strong can lose at least a large degree of their power. R brilliant. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, I love this um, bottom of page 463. The paragraph begins in acquiring the wisdom of the Babylonians, but I want to jump down a little bit about midway through that paragraph. They placed themselves in connection with the source of all wisdom. See, they placed themselves mm. in the stream of God's blessing, making the knowledge of God the foundation of their education. In faith, they prayed for wisdom. They lived their prayers, which I thought was a really cool thing to say. They placed themselves where God could bless them. There it is again. So you have that two times there. They placed themselves... And then she says it again. They placed themselves oh, that's good. where God could bless them. They avoided that which would weaken their powers and improved every opportunity to become intelligent in all lines of learning. They followed the rules of life that could not fail to give them strength of intellect. Now watch this. This is key. They sought to acquire knowledge for one purpose. Not for multiple purposes. For one purpose. Top of page 464. Mm -hmm. That they might honor God. They realized that in order to stand as representatives of true religion amid the false religions of heathenism, they must have clearness of intellect and must perfect a Christian character. And God himself was their teacher, constantly praying, conscientiously studying, keeping in touch with the unseen. They walked with God as did Enoch. And I just love this idea here that the big idea, the big overriding purpose to which they are seeking to, to align themselves mm -hmm. is the glory of God, the goodness of God, mm -hmm. the truth of God, the beauty of God, God. That that's what they're after. It's mm -hmm. not just, hey, look at us. We're smarter. We're better. We have better, you know, uh, uh, habits and lifestyle choices. No, no. They're just trying to direct attention, mm -hmm. deflect attention to Yahweh. What else you got? Yeah, I mean, I'm jumping ahead, but it, on the next page is a similar idea. In them, a heathen nation beheld an illustration of the goodness and beneficence of God and of the love of Christ. And what I wrote there was, the goal of health is love. Right? Like, ooh, say that again. Say that again. The goal of health is love. Unpack that. If we invest in our health, you know, we're able to be more present, more uh, available to people physically, mm. emotionally. Um, we're able to also show that God is love and that His principles are, are working in that our is lives. So good. Um, 
But yeah, it's so easy to get caught in these little specific health things. Should I eat this? Should I not do this? And, and it's not that, you know, it's not important to think about those things, but the overall goal, why does God want us to be healthy? Because he wants us to be able to experience his love better and because he wants us to be able to love other people better. Elise, I just wrote this in here. Oh. It's so good. The goal of health is love. Elise Harbold. I love that. That's such a, that's so simply communicated, you know, because what did Jesus say when he was asked about the great command? The first command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm. mind, and soul. The second is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, your heart, your mind, and your soul are far more capacitated and are able to work more efficiently and clearly if we're in good health. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really great. So well communicated. On page, just jumping back to page 464, she gets into this idea of cooperation. Cooperation. And if you go down to the paragraph that begins, as the Lord cooperated with Daniel. Yeah. As the Lord cooperated with Daniel and his fellows, so he will cooperate with all who strive to do his will. And by the impartation of his spirit, he will strengthen every true purpose, every noble resolution. So that's the other thing that's going on here is that they're aligning their will with God's will. And then God comes in by his spirit and he strengthens them and blesses them in ways that actually are greater than just the physical blessings that could mm. be sort of, you know, accumulated by, you know, abstaining from wine and, you know, drinking water and eating a vegetarian. All of that's fine and good. But the thing that's really adding the 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 gas to the engine or the the acceleration or the momentum is that they're placing themselves in harmony with what God had revealed in Torah, what their parents had taught, and then God can bless that. Hmm. God, I think it's a funny story. I think I might have told this story before, but years ago, I have a friend. His name is Jay, and uh, he's a he's a health reformer, like a passionate health reformer. And we were at this event. Have, I, have you heard this story before? It's a great story. I don't think so. So it was an event. Anyway, so there was like 20 or 30 people there. It was a kind of a big event. And all of this food was sort of wheeled out. And we were getting ready to eat. And the person that was hosting the event asked Jay if he would please bless the food or, or ask God to bless the food. Uh -oh. And Jay, he, he just, I, I, it was just like, hey, would you please bless the food? And just like, he looks over and his eye just slowly takes in the whole big you know, buffet there. And this is what he prays. I'll never forget this. He says, God in heaven, bless the food you can bless. <laughs> <laughs> and praise this prayer. And the whole prayer is bless what you can bless, right? Because sometimes we ask God to bless things that God's like, how are you asking me to bless that? And not just, not just food, but just lots of different things. You know, God bless me as I, you know. As I make this terrible decision. As I make this really bad decision, Please put your blessing on it. So I'll never forget that. And it actually sort of settles in me. It's like, God, bless what you can bless. And forgive me if I ever ask you to bless something that you have said in your word you can't bless. So I like that. Um, would you read the bot would you read that paragraph there, okay. right there, bottom of page 464? God brought Daniel. God brought Daniel and his associates into connection with the great men of Babylon that in the midst of a nation of idolaters, they might represent his character. How did they become fitted for a position of so great trust and honor? It was faithfulness in little things that gave complexion to their whole life. Mm. They honored God in the smallest duties as well as in the larger responsibilities. Yeah, I love it. That's great. So here again, they're representing the character of God. They've been placed in this position of, of honor and and they are faithful in the small things. I mean, Jesus is going to say this, right? He that is faithful in that which is least mm. will be faithful and also it will be faithful also in that which is much or great. So how do we at least how we talked just briefly about this tonight when we were eating sushi? How do we affirm this idea that mm -hmm. we want to be faithful in the little things that then sort of accumulates moral stamina and momentum and allows us to be faithful in the larger things without giving way to the sort of pathologies of so scrutinizing our behavior that we become paralyzed because that is a, people do fall into that yeah. ditch. And, you know, there's even diagnoses like scrupulosity and, yeah. and OCD. H how do we, you know, as somebody who's does mental health coaching and who is, you know, very, has a nursing degree, very savvy in the counseling field. How, how do you, how do you balance that? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're bringing this up because I think um, when we 
you know, when we read things like Daniel chapter one and we're like, oh, health is a spiritual thing. Whoa, I need to take this really seriously. And then, you know, read other things perhaps that Ellen White writes about health. It can be easy to to be super enthusiastic about, which is good. Mm. Um, but many times people that are super enthusiastic about health movements, if they're not careful, can end up becoming imbalanced. So I would say uh, I'm one of those people when I first kind of encounter some of this stuff, whoa, God takes my health really seriously. I haven't been careful enough. I started reading all these things and became very obsessed with what I was eating with, you know, I have to, I have to exercise a certain amount um, and a certain intensity every day or else I'm sinning. Uh, if I eat this way, then God is happy with me. If I don't, he's not. And so I ended up actually becoming very unhealthy mm. in certain areas of my life, like my emotional health, my probably relational health suffered because of those things, because I was um, focusing on just one aspect. And so I think um, that the type of health that God calls us to is a very broad, mm. balanced health. God understands that change sometimes is slow. Um, and, you know, there are basic things that God just says, do this and don't do, don't do that. But don't eat unclean foods. Right. But like if someone wants to, you know, start exercising more, that may be a gradual journey. If someone wants to start making um, a shift towards plant-based eating, that may be a gradual journey. And if we find ourselves obsessing about something so much that, you know, it's causing a lot of negative self-talk or causing us to judge other people that may be a sign that we're approaching it the wrong way. Mm. Like we need all of our efforts to being healthy, to be really saturated in God's love because you don't see Daniel and his friends thinking, oh, maybe we can get God to love and accept us if mm. we eat this way. It's like they feel so loved and accepted by God. They want to be loving to others. And that's why they're doing this. They're not working towards something. They're working from something. Yeah. Okay, what about scrupulosity in particular? The the how do we distinguish between because some of the things that she writes here in this last two pages could lead some people that whose minds mm -hmm. are prone to this way of thinking, like I have to do I can't do anything that's wrong and I have to do everything that's right. Right. How do you how would we know if we were falling into behavior that might be actually unhealthy in the pursuit of health? So you said negative self-talk, yeah, um, judge, judgment of others. A lot of anxious thoughts. Okay, anxious thoughts. Um, it's damaging other parts of your life. Okay. You know, it's not a goal that you're approaching with joy, and, um, but drudgery. Um, it feels like a burden almost. Yeah, because, you know, there are people that have lost a lot of weight or ended up developing nutrition problems because they're so careful about what they eat. Um, so those could be signs too. But I also think um, a, a big part of it is, are we judging others? Like, am I getting some sort of self-righteousness mm. hit when I do this? Because sometimes we just replace a bad habit with self-righteousness, mm. you know? Yeah, well said. And so like, we don't want to be... Um, I don't know the right way to, um, we don't want to make the mistake of becoming actually less spiritually healthy mm. because we are, you know, allowing this diseased thinking about either ourselves, like this is why God accepts me. What does that say about God? Mm, wow. Um, there you or, go. Or there I'm go. better than this other person. To start getting, you know, into that kind of thinking could potentially be much less healthy than, you know, eating the thing that you were thinking. Although I do believe that God can, uh, eating what you were eating before, I mean, I do believe that God can and does want to lead us into healing choices. Um, but we need to pay, I think, very close attention to where our thoughts are and to you know, not only physical health, but mental, emotional, relational, spiritual health. Thank you. Yeah, the, the word health comes from an old word that was like the word whole. And it like comes from the word whole. Mm -hmm. So so when we think about health, you know, we shouldn't just think narrowly about six pack abs, bulging biceps, ability to run a sub six minute mile or whatever it might be. These sort right. of markers. We want to be thinking about how are my relationships and how do I feel when I get up in the morning? Is is my life generally optimistic and upbeat? Like 
How do I treat people? How do I think about God? And the gospel, the gospel of God's saving righteousness given to us undeserved because of what Jesus has done and is doing, that has to be central to any moral development. Mm. If we ever think that we're working toward something in terms of our salvational standing with God, then yeah. you've already lost the battle. This is, um, it reminds me of something Martin Luther wrote. Um, he said, each of us has in our hearts a horrible religious fanatic that wants to every day be like, oh, look what I did. I can have at peace. I can be at peace with God because I did that. Right. Um, when really we constantly need to be trusting in, in Christ's righteousness. Oh, there's a good resource uh, for people struggling with scrupulosity. Okay. What is it? Uh, scrupulosity.com. Okay. It's um, and a really nice girl, Jamie Eckert. I don't know if you've met her. No. That runs that. And she actually, she has blogs and resources and she also does coaching and group coaching. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. Good for her. Okay, and she's a friend. Um, I I have met her virtually, but yeah, I know she knows Jennifer, and and there's several um, there's several mental health coaches or counselors that are familiar with scrupulosity or that have experienced it personally. Um, so there is help for this. Like it can be a very mm. you know isolating thing. You can feel crazy, but there's help available. I want to read uh, middle of page 466. Thank you for that, Elise. Yeah. Paragraph begins, the Hebrew worthies were men of like passions. You want to read that? 466, 489 of the original. The Hebrew worthies were men of like passions with ourselves, yet notwithstanding the seductive influences of the court of Babylon, they stood firm because they depended upon a strength that is infinite. Mm. In them, a heathen nation beheld an illustration of this is what the goodness you and beneficence of God and of the love of Christ. And in their experience, we have an instance of the triumph of principle over temptation, of purity over depravity, of devotion and loyalty over atheism and idolatry. So you see there again, the devotion and mm -hmm. loyalty. That This is one of the great paragraphs for me. And then I'm going to read the last two paragraphs as well. What a life work was that of these noble Hebrews. As they bid farewell to their childhood home, little did they dream what a high destiny was to be theirs. Faithful and steadfast, they yielded to the divine guiding so that through them God could fulfill his purpose. The same mighty truths that were revealed through these men, God desires to reveal through the youth and children today. And adults too, of course. You too, David. Me too. The life of Daniel and his fellows is a demonstration of what he will do for those who yield themselves to him and with the whole heart, whole heart, mm. whole that's good. Seek to accomplish his purpose. Can I borrow your highlight? You can borrow anything, of course. Um, and I love my favorite line of the whole session here, Elise, has been the goal of health is love. Mm. I love that. I'm, I'm going to quote you in that. I'm going to say, my, like my friend Elise says, the goal of health is love. Someone may have said that before. I'm not aware that they have. I hope I'm the first one. Yeah. It's sometimes you say really clever things. I don't want to be plagiarizing. <laughs> Um, okay, let's do our rubric here. What a great chapter. Um, the point, the person, the prayer, the practice, and the promise. Elise, for you, what was the point of this chapter? Point. We have the goal of health is love. Okay. And the small everyday choices we make largely determine the picture of God that we give to the world. Extremely well said. What'd you say? I just put to tell of the faithfulness and loyalty of Daniel and his companions in the royal court uh -huh. of Babylon and primarily of God's faithfulness to them. Because yeah. that's really the story here. She several times uses the idea of source. Mm -hmm. that, that They leaned on the source. They placed themselves where God could bless them. Like, this is n Daniel and his companions are not the heroes here. They're the vehicles mm. through which God works heroically, right? Like, they're willing to be used by God. And so is this a story about their faithfulness? Yes, but their faithfulness as a reflection and as a vehicle for God's faithfulness to them. That's how that's how I see it. Uh, yes. The person, what do we learn about God here? God is eager to bless our efforts to live the way he designed us to live. Okay, listen to what I wrote. Very similar to what you wrote. Mm -hmm. God longs to bless and build his people. Mm -hmm. His amazing providences are awaiting our withdrawal. Ooh. Yeah, you like that? So I was thinking about how there's so many great little providences here, like the guard that was placed over the Hebrew worthies was somebody that Daniel could work with and negotiate mm -hmm. with. Like that's a providence. And very often when we take stands 
for the truth, or we take stands for the gospel, or we take stands for God, God will arrange providentially situations socially and professionally and in other ways so that God can then, our standing for God can can find its way forward and really accomplish the thing that God wants. Because if there had been a different kind of person there, even if Daniel had been winning and had used all the correct negotiation tactics, this guy could have just said, absolutely not. Right. And then we have a totally different story. Right. We probably don't have this story at all. So so we stand and then God works, right? And we're going to see this in Daniel chapter 3, of mm-hmm. course. Um, how do we pray this chapter? I put, God, help me remember that the small choices I make are actually a way for me to love you and others. Oh, beautiful. Father, give me the courage and conviction of Daniel and his friends. Teach me how to purpose in my heart for your glory. Because mm. I, I love that theme again and again, that they did this for the glory of God, for God's glory, to represent his character. They saw themselves as representatives. That's another word she uses over mm-hmm. and over again. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we practice this chapter? Oh, no. Oh, you went praise. Is it practice? It's practice, but let's hear praise. That's fine. How do we praise God for this chapter? <laughs> I did it wrong. Oh, you're fine. I put, God, thank you for showing us how to be well. Oh, very good. How do we practice it? I put purpose, 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 and prioritize the small things. Because she mm. just, over and over again, she uses this word purpose. Playing off of Daniel purposed in his heart. Yeah. So, you know, a word that we would use today is we would say resolve. Okay. and and Or set goals. Like, I'm a goal setter. I love to accomplish things. It's one of my favorite things, for example, about rock climbing or bird watching. You know, you can you can go to look for something and you can see it. You accomplished it. You did it. You purposed. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certain things that you're not going to accomplish in your life if you just let life happen to you. It's one of my favorite things that Ty Gibson says is don't let life just happen to you. You happen to your life. Mm-hmm. You, you write your life. You and Jesus take control, make goals purpose in your heart and God can honor that and he will honor that. Hmm. Okay, then finally promise. Did you do promise? I did. Okay. I just put 1 Samuel 2.30. Um, those that honor me, I will those honor. Those who honor me, I will honor. Yep. Brilliant. I did something right from the chapter, page 464. The Lord renders futile every agency that works for the defeat of his chosen hmm. ones. And in his strength, they may overcome every temptation and conquer every difficulty. The Lord renders futile. So when we take a stand for God, if the satanic powers and principalities try to stand against us, God is able to render all of those principalities futile because God is God and he reigns supreme. Mm. And that's that's the real, that's the story here, right? Like you have these three, four young Hebrew boys. They're in the court of Babylon. The world is against them. The situation is against them. Everything is against them. And yet... They prevail, but they prevail in such a way that God, their God, Yahweh, comes off looking awesome. I mean, right? Like they won the 10-day test. And then at the end of the three years, Nebuchadnezzar is like, wow, who are these for? You know, these guys are remarkable. So the win is for Yahweh and for this would have, you can just imagine the, you know, because she describes how these wise men were in the court of Babylon and they're just like, who are these people? Mm. And it gets the mind. Yeah. That's actually what happened with me in my conversion. Like when I first went into that vegetarian restaurant as like a 21, 22 year old kid, I was like, who are these people? They were different. Mm-hmm. The way they treated people, the way they were friendly, the way they were helpful, the way they served, the way they dressed, mm-hmm. the way they talked. And it elicited questions, curiosity. I'd say, why do you do this? And why do you say that? And why do you not do this? And why do you talk that way? And why do you serve this? And why do you eat like this? And now I'm interested. And then yeah. this just gave them opportunity to say, well, we do, because, it, and they were very savvy. They would answer the questions in such a way that they would only give me just a little bit, which left me wanting more. Yeah. Which is smart. Too often mm. when somebody asks any question or makes any inquiry of our religious faith, we're like, oh, and we just right. give them the whole, we just back the truck up. Beep, beep, yeah. beep. We just like, I you think know. in business, sometimes they talk about creating a, a pull rather than a push. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It was a pull for you. Oh, they pulled, Mm -hmm. they pulled. But they did it so wisely. And they were, I mean, they were a little singular, to use Ellen White's word. Mm -hmm. They were a little interesting, a little weird. I'd never heard of Seventh-day Adventists before, and I wouldn't have identified as a Christian. But there were so many things about these people that that were simultaneously singular 
and attractive. Mm -hmm. And over, it, and it wasn't over a short time, it was over like two years, sort of cumulatively, I became very, very, very interested. And that's when they gave me the book, The Great Controversy, which is the fifth volume in the Conflict of the Ages series. I read it and here we are. Here we are. And here we are. Okay, let's do our word. Okay. Now, at least don't, don't give your word yet because we want to see what everybody else's word was. Oh, right. So we'll pull this over here so we can actually see this. All right. So what was your word here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Purpose. 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 purpose patriotism. patriotism. Oh, I love it. Uh, let's see. Uncontaminated. Great word. Mm. She uses that. Loyalty. Tennessee Quilt Bug says purpose. Arlene, another loyalty. Cassandra says placed. Examples. Cooperation, Marco. Very good. Oh, very good, Deb. Whole. So many great words for oh, this chapter. Yep. Allegiance. Represent. Another great word. Resistance. Placed. Firm. Donna says purpose. I should just say that's my word as well. Purpose. Hmm. Unwavering. Character. Jennifer. Look at Jennifer. Oh. We love you, I, Jennifer. We miss you. I saw, I saw she wrote earlier that her muscles are growing. Her muscles. Yeah. I've been telling her to lift weights. Decisive. Representative, design, firm, testimony, representative, determined. Oh, Christian, Victor Mills. Hey, Victor, I like your new, uh, you've got a new uh, avatar there. I like it. Um, reliance, resolve, conscientiously. I missed one there. Uh, determined, there it is. Um, through, Stefan. Oh, I like that. Yep. Decisiveness, goal. Goal. D A. I don't know what that means. Oh, Jennifer says she loves uh, us too. New logo. Well done, Victor. I really like it. He's a graphic designer. Oh, nice. Steel. Yeah. Oh, come yeah. On, you know where that on. comes from. Very good. The Gabby Gabby. Abby. Abby. Yeah. Love her. She's wonderful. Um, Patriots. Stefan's second word is resolute. Hello, pastor from PH. Where's PH? Philippines? PH. Where would that be from? Honor, unhesitating, constant. At five Carson so five said most of us had purpose yesterday. Yep, yep. Integrity. That's true. Fidelity. Fidelity, great word. Mm -hmm. Very good. What was your word? Um, so my word is purpose. Oh, same word. However, I was thinking Okay, let's not go. only uh Daniel purposed, we can purpose, yeah. but also what's the purpose of purposing? And Ooh. back to the purpose of health is love or the perfect, the purpose of obedience is love. So it kind of has a double or triple meaning. That's the best line in the whole day is the goal of health is love. I'm going to quote you on that over and over and over again. I absolutely love that. The goal of health is love. So let me just read these here to carry out God's purpose. He purposed in his heart. Uh, the United uh, the united earnestness of purpose, diligence, and steadfast. Um, he will strengthen every true purpose for one purpose, and then finally to fulfill his purpose and to accomplish his purpose. Purpose is the last word in the chapter. Yep. So, and, and purpose kind of has this like, you know, for what purpose? And then also to purpose yeah. in your heart, like a verb. All of this, or to do something intentionally or meaningfully. I did it on purpose. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really great sort of, you know, multi-use, yep. you know, multi-meaning word that captures several of the different dimensions of not just our chapter in Prophets and Kings, but Daniel chapter one is really about God's purpose and Daniel's purpose and the purpose of their purpose, mm -hmm. which is to bring glory to to God and, and to really put on display his faithfulness. Yep. So great. We had the same word and we never talked about it. That's sometimes it happens that way. And a lot of people tonight had purpose. Yep. So everybody, tomorrow we will be back on at seven o'clock. We have a double chapter tomorrow. So Daniel chapter two and three, which is Prophets and Kings chapters must be 40 and 41. Yeah. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream and then... This is such a great story. The Fiery Furnace. And just a, a little warning, we will sign on tomorrow night about 15 minutes early because I think tomorrow, especially with the double, two people, We'll be over an hour and a half tomorrow night. I'm just going to say that. That's my suspicion. Because we got to do two chapters. Should I try to talk as fast as you talk? You should talk as fast as I talk. <laughs> when I, now when I talk fast, I sometimes just 
slur my words and it, it doesn't work as well. But tomorrow night, prepare yourself for a good in-depth session, two chapters, seven o'clock. We'll sign on a little early. Elise, can I, did you open with prayer, didn't I you? I did. It's okay, your turn. let's pray. Father in heaven, we want a purpose in our heart. And we want to remember that the purpose for which we purpose is that we might bring glory to your name and that others might see in some small but significant way um, you in us and in our decisions. Father, the big decisions, but as we've learned tonight, also the small decisions. So Father, in our various situations and circumstances and our spheres of influence, whether it's professional or family or neighborhood, whatever it is, help us to be people that are maybe a little weird, a little odd, a little singular, not for the purpose of being a little weird, odd, and singular, but because we are living our lives differently to the beat of a different drum. We're, we're not destined to end our lives and to live our whole lives here on this planet. We were made for something different, something bigger, something better, something higher. And Father, may others see that in us, and then may there be inquiry and curiosity and the opportunity to tell others of how awesome you are. Um, Father, help us to remember that the goal of health is love, supreme love for you, and authentic love for those around us. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.